Become spell weavers, reavers, rogues, and men at arms, and answer the call of adventure. Pick up your sword, your axe, your spell book, your bow, your rule book, and your dice, and join the forces of good in their eternal fight against vile monsters, conspiring min maxers, horny bards, and blood soaked murder hobos. Discover the treasure trove of role playing games here on Rollin' Bones. My name is Ryan Howard, and I shall be your guide. Good evening, Boneheads, and welcome back to Rolling Bones with Ryan Howard, where we are making old school young again. I'm your host and king of the Boneheads, Ryan Howard. And uh, yeah, I'm not dead. I assure you guys, I am. Uh, I am still here, despite how uh, infrequent uh, things have been over the past couple weeks. I, I am still very much dedicated to doing this for you guys. So we're back. We're here, and uh, I'm very excited for tonight's show because we are joined once again by uh, Dr. Greg Gillespie. And tonight we're going to be talking about something that is very personal to both of us, as it involves our family histories. And that is incorporating the history and folklore of the land of Scotland into your tabletops. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to remind everyone to like, share, and subscribe if you are uh, enjoying what you see over here on Rolling Bones and you know want to want to support us, want to help us out a little bit. That's the best way to do that. Just you know, like, share, and subscribe. Give us a little algorithm bump. And, uh, of course, I want to remind everyone that you can find me on all the various social media here on the bottom of the screen at X and Instagram. I am at Howard underscore Ryan Greg. YouTube is Rolling Bones. Twitch is twitch.tv slash Rolling Bones Ryan. And Substack is rollingbones.substack.com. Uh, Substack is another place where I've been kind of letting everyone down recently, but I will be back there with more articles uh, once we get past the... Uh, the big crunch on uh, my Kickstarter, which is going pretty well. Uh, once again, I want to remind everyone that the uh, the Kickstarter for Guts and Glory Volume 1, which is the collaboration between myself and the Wonky, everyone's favorite Alaskan, is still live over on Kickstarter. We are at just over $4,000 raised. Uh, we have just unlocked the stretch goal for uh, poster maps for deluxe backers. So if you want to get a hold of that, there are still some deluxe pledges available. Uh, limited edition, it looks like there are 116 of those left, uh, unclaimed for those of you who want to get in on uh, this game and uh, potentially, once we reach that uh, $6,000 mark, uh, see that hard cover. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where we end up. And uh, speaking of the Kickstarter campaign and wonky, uh, he and I will be on a couple shows over the next couple weeks. Uh, this week, this Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Central, uh, we will be on Black Lodge Games talking about our Kickstarter and having fun over there with young Steve and Ginger Frazier. And then next week, we'll actually be on Diversity and Dragons. Uh, it'll be my first time over there with Double D. That'll be a ton of fun. You know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and I know Keelan is as well. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what we've got coming up. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and bring on the man of the hour uh, here to drop some knowledge on us about the history and heritage that we both share in the Scottish Highlands and the Scottish Lowlands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Greg Gillespie. Hello. Hi, Ryan. Everyone out there, how's it going? Oh, uh, it's going all right. You doing okay? Doing well. I'm ready to go. There we go. So yeah, um, I, I wanted to do this I got to thinking about this, not just with you, but with a couple other people I know. Obviously, you know, my good friend Victor Gorchev has a lot of Dutch heritage and, you know, several other people I know have uh, kind of various European backgrounds. Fantasy is a mess, a hodgepodge of multiple different European traditions at this point. And so I felt it would be interesting to focus in on some kind of specific ethnic backgrounds. And one of the first people that came to mind when, you know, that thought entered my head was you since, I mean, you, you take a look at, at Barrow Maze and Darrow Deep and all the stuff that you've done over the years, there is clearly a lot of influence of your heritage in there. So 
Let's begin with discussing some of that heritage. Where exactly do the Gillespies come from? So uh, my uh, parents were born in uh, Scotland, in uh, the Dune Valley. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Rob, Scottish poet Robert Burns, and uh, and so it's been uh, they immigrated to Canada, um, and then uh, in the early 1960s there, and uh, it's been a big, really big part of my of my upbringing. So the um, and not just in terms of uh, having an interest in the culture and heritage and music and art and things of that nature, but also the worldview. The Scottish worldview is one that's very black and white and uh, things are one way or the other. They're done right or they're done wrong. There's not a lot of shades of gray in there, but that's actually served me very, very well over the years as I've gone through my education, moving from city to city and different universities and just basically taking that kind of that, um, Scottish uh, blue collar work ethic to, uh, to things has always been an advantage uh, for me. So um, the Gillespies, um, uh, actually my, my grandfather was one of nine boys, if you can believe that or not. Um, <laughs> and so uh, he had, an, my great grandfather had an idea to, uh, to come to Canada, but didn't do it. He passed that on to uh, his sons, and uh, two, uh, well, uh, my grandfather was one of, of those nine boys and two of them uh, came to Canada within about five uh, years of each other uh, after the Second World War. And so uh, I was just, <clears throat> that's sort of like the, the basic background. And, um, and uh, so I've always taken an interest in uh, my heritage. And for those that don't know, uh, I'm also a Highland bagpiper. So we can speak about that too as we move along if you like. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm one of the few Americans who doesn't immediately dry heave when the word bagpipe is said. I actually find the bagpipe to be quite a beautiful instrument, so we can definitely talk a little bit about that. But yeah, I, as for my family, um, I mean, we've been in America forever. We're we're heritage Americans, going all the way back to the 1600s. But my my father's side of the family is a majority Ulster Scott. So for those of you who haven't heard me talk about that before, there was this uh, movement from uh, the, the English crown all the way back in the 16th century, basically to deal with the Irish. And colonization. Say what? Colonization. Yes, colonization. We're, we're colonizers going way back. <laughs> but one of the ways that they decided to deal with the Irish was we're going to send the Scottish in there to take care of them. And so there was this movement called the Ulster Plantation where lowland uh, Scots were relocated to Ulster and basically told, you know, civilize the Catholics and it led to multiple different uh, conflicts that kind of would heat up and the the Covenanters would get in a lot of trouble and then the English would come in and help them and then they'd leave and they'd get into more trouble. Uh, there was a whole series of incidents all around the English Civil War that happened with uh, this people group and it was right around the time of the English Civil War, where many of the Ulster Scots said, this is not worth it. We're going to go to the New World. Most of them ended up in the Carolinas and Virginia. And <laughs> that is where my family came from. And coincidentally, that's where Robert E. Howard's family came from. So mm -hmm. that's where uh, that's where my kind of Scottish heritage comes in. Although I am told that somewhere along the way, we are descended from uh, the Maclean's of Duart up on the Isle of Mull, mm -hmm. but I don't have as strong ties to them as I do to the Ulster plantation. Fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's lots of, even just from, from that, there's lots of interesting things to be extrapolated from, uh, you know, and, and take into a tabletop, you know, you, you look at something like the Ulster Plantation and you have basically a bunch of uh, poor fighting men 
sent into an unfamiliar region by a crown and told to, uh, you know, survive and, and deal with these uh, uppity Irishmen. And, you know, even just that concept alone could be the beginnings of a campaign for a lot of people. <laughs> Oh, without question. Um, you know, I think the uh, I've I've been through piping. I've been exposed to uh, both uh, folks that are ultra Sc ultra Scott. So some of them play in pipe bands where there are no Catholics allowed whatsoever, and uh, <laughs> they would rather be a, a crappier band than have have Catholics <laughs> in the band. That's how hardcore they are. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't uh, really had too much of that in Scotland itself, but you definitely hear of, of those stories in uh, Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's like that old joke where uh, St. Peter's taking people through heaven and he gets to one section and he holds his finger to his lips and says, all right, be quiet. The Calvinists are here and they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> Well, the uh, once I played uh, in a band where uh, everyone, I wouldn't say everyone was particularly religiously um, um, devout, but there was uh, one guy in the band that that w was raised Catholic, where the rest of us were kind of raised Protestant or um, kind of not at all. But um, we would play this tune uh, on the pipes called The Sash My Father Wore. And the sash refers to the Protestant orange men, the orange sash that they would wear uh, when they would parade and do things like that. And um, it was kind of seen as uh, a bit of an antagonistic song. So yep. um, now we did this, you have to understand, this is in jest, this is in fun with a fellow yep. bandmate. So we would all kind of surround him with our bagpipes all playing the sash my father wore <laughs> just to get a rise out of him. And he'd stand there and they go, all right, yeah, I get it. And, uh, but so, you know, it's always uh, just been very friendly, fun antagonism in the context that I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's those, those old ethnic religious rivalries that several of us can't let go of that, <laughs> that drive us on. Even even some of my Catholic friends who I, I know and love and, uh, you know, have great fondness for. I tell them that it, it, the second that I converted to Catholicism, my ancestors would come back from the dead to beat me up. <laughs> so Presbyterian, I remain. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're on the subject of, of bagpipes that. There's always been this um, disconnect between historical concepts of what like a, a warrior musician or, uh, you know, a, a bard of antiquity are like versus what, you know, bards have become at the table. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the traditional role of the piper, this is something that I find very interesting as an archetype that people should be using for their bards talk a little bit about you know what what the piper's role was in you know kind of the the traditions of scotland sure so the um the tradition of piping is one that uh in in scottish culture it goes all the way back to the um um uh, to dunvegan on the isle of sky for the first kind of hereditary uh pipers so um and if, in case people don't know uh, you learn pipes on a uh, recorder-like instrument called a chanter, and the cha so it's um, just it's mouth blown. It's very easy to play, and you learn all the finger techniques on the chanter. And it's called the chanter because the um, bagpipe no, um, music predates musical notation. So what you would do is, um, from mentor to student, the mentor would literally chant the tune and each um, sound made would correspond to a tech a finger technique on the instrument so you would you would learn a tune by chanting it from mentor to student and uh, so that's where this whole notion of chant of the chanter comes from and then a couple other interesting pieces of information that people may not know 
is that there's um, kind of two different types of pipe music. There's uh, the light music. So the light music would be things like uh, jigs and reels and hornpipes and marches and um, things like that. And then there's the big music, which is the classical music of the bagpipe. And it, it is, um, it's an acquired taste. It doesn't have the, uh, the um, melody that light music tends to have, but it's the, it's the, um, the music of, of, the, of the ancient pipe. And not all pipers can play uh, pibroch, it's called, or, big, or the big music. And a tune could take you anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to play. So there's a great deal of memorization involved with that kind of thing because you don't get to walk around with your music like other um, in other uh, musicians do. So that's a couple things. Now, the role of the piper in Scottish society, you know, to um, a, a piper is the equivalent of Batman's Robin. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're never in the front per se unless it's a war, um, but rather you're ubiquitous in the background. You're there, you write music when uh, one of your friends has a child, uh, you uh, play at weddings in the background, um, you'll play in pubs in the background, you will play in funerals at the background, in the background. So, you know, you're very much Batman's Robin and that's that's your role. That's your you're to be there for the culture, for the people, and um, and and tradition bear over the over the the course of your lifetime, and then teach at least one or two people so that they can carry on that tradition moving forward. So you, it's very much um, uh, it's a calling as opposed to a musical instrument, and you have to be prepared to do those things. You have to be prepared to play under duress when your friends die and your family members die. And uh, if called on, then, and um, you know, if, if you're called to a fight in, in, in a war with your bagpipes as opposed to a rifle, then that's exactly what you do. And you spur on, your job is to spur on others and, uh, and inspire them. And um, it's very much a calling as opposed to a musical instrument. Yep. Yeah. It's, and, and this is kind of digging into the, the traditions of Ireland more so than Scotland. But when you look at the way that kind of Druidic culture was built over, uh, you know, in, in with the Celts, the the bard as we know it descends from that role. And bards were recorders of history. And it sounds very much like pipers in, in Scottish tradition are a kind of recorder of history in that they are present for major events and providing uh, music that is appropriate to the events, uh, you know, that are, that are taking place. Mm -hmm. And so when, when it comes to bringing that to the table, if you were to, for example, play a bard who was kind of the archetypal uh, Highland bagpiper, you wouldn't necessarily, it sounds like, be you know trying to bed everything with a pulse. It's more that you would be observing events and essentially letting letting your music kind of shape and record and influence these events, especially in uh, like the circumstances you described of going to war and standing side by side with uh, with your brothers in combat. Uh, however, it's your job to keep them fighting rather than to fight yourself. Yeah, well, they're in, uh, you know, so it's not, um, uh, it's not a, in gaming terms, it's not a comedic role. And oftentimes, I think in gaming, we think of the bard um, in a comedic, uh, with a comedic motif. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's definitely, um, you know, if you're, if you're um, playing music, uh, light music to, um, to break uh, the seriousness, or something like that, which which we will do, um, but but that that in itself has a purpose, right? You're you're not doing it for comedic relief for yourself or um, to to uh, play a joke, but rather it's it's for a purpose. And you can see examples of pipers in World War One um, playing, um, you know, when uh, when soldiers would have 
downtime uh, to play songs that would remind them of home, to play songs that they could sing along with that they learned growing up on their on their father's knees and uh, and and to uh, to break the monotony uh, of war. And uh, you know the interesting thing isn't so much the music because. Uh, if you, you know, in a, a combat setting, uh, odds are, as loud, as loud as the pipes are, you're probably not going to hear them. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so then, so then what's the role of the piper? The piper is to, to in the, the image of the piper is supposed to be just as romantic and strong uh, as, the, as the music itself. Because odds are, if there's bombs exploding... And uh, bullets flying, you probably can't hear the pipe, the piper, unless there's a whole bunch of them, and that's not usually not the case. So uh, that's that's just kind of an interesting side note to to the role of the piper. Yeah, yeah, and and that role even carries all the way into early modern warfare, <laughs> at least up through. Uh, I mean, the American Civil War. There were still uh, fife and drum corps, uh, even up through the end of the war. So this is a tradition that kind of carries through across multiple cultures and, and even probably takes some influence from that culture, especially when you consider the uh, ethnic influence of Scotland on, say, the, the Confederate army in particular. Oh, and uh, yeah, the um, yeah, the Confederate flag comes from the St. Andrews flag. That's the, it does. That's, that's the base of it. And, you know, so like, for example, I can play music going all the way back to the 1745 rebellion. I can play stuff from the Boer War. I can play stuff from World War One. I. I can play stuff from World War II. Uh, I can play stuff from the Falklands conflict. Uh, any major uh, conflict that has involved Highland regiments or Highland troops, uh, they've written music uh, about it. So, you know, that's, um, that's part of the, uh, that's part of uh, developing a repertoire as a piper to uh, play the play the music that has inspired over time, it's very much um, connected to to uh, culture and time. That that we we play the roles that we play to carry on those traditions, and um, and then we write music for ourselves, and then those can get played. And it's very rare to for a piper a, a composer to be recognized while they're still alive. It almost never happens. And it's happened once in, in my generation. And, and that guy was a true, um, a, a, a true uh, savant, musical savant. So um, mm -hmm. we have these, you know, these really interesting dynamics and in, in, in play. And, 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 and speaking of, you know, as it relates to gaming, there's a lot of evocative tune titles for, for pipe music that have definitely inspired aspects of my game or uh, have uh, inspired uh, name locations, things like that, in my uh, in my home game. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Now there uh, there are you know to to pivot a little bit and but still stick with one of the things that you brought up. There there's a a unit that is very famous amongst the Scottish military. I, I'm sure even a lot of the people out there have heard of the Black Watch. Mm -hmm. That's another historical concept that I find fascinating because uh, for anyone out there unfamiliar, the Black Watch is a Scottish regiment of the UK's army. So these are these are men who are taken from Scotland. They are Scottish. Uh, they dress in a, a Scottish manner all the way up through World War One, where they found out that in modern warfare, kilts aren't necessarily uh, the the best tactical clothing anymore. But these guys essentially are deployed in every single foreign conflict that uh, the the UK is involved in, up to and including uh, action in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, in the modern day. Um, so this is something that speaks to the, you know, something like the the Black Company, that series of books, this traveling unit of men who are displaced from their home going around the world 
solving the problems of a uh, a crown that rules over them. This is also fertile ground for adventuring in in my eyes. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, there are <clears throat> a number. It's very interesting when you think of the uh, what what seems like sort of paradoxes. So the uh, the Scots are fighting their own rebellions. They get defeated in uh, the 15 and and the 45. And then uh, as a result of that, incorporating the bagpipe and Highland regiments into the British army, it was both a blessing and a curse. In part, it saved the music, but it also codified it and regimented it in a way that wasn't necessarily the way it was before that happened. So um, when we think about piping music, we're think of, thinking about it as distilled through 300 years of British military tradition. Mm -hmm. So, and there, as I said, nobody plays the big music of, of the uh, Highland bagpipe really, except the very well-versed experts. And that was the predominant form of the music uh, prior to its incorporation into the British army. Yep. Yeah, and it's, <clears throat> It, it, it fascinates me as an American with a very short history. It fascinates me when you look at European military units and you can see traditions that go back hundreds and hundreds of years, sometimes even thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know, in this kind of modern deracinated world that we live in, it's it's always interesting to see traditions that are held onto and, and upheld and carried forward by, uh, you know, generations and generations. And it, it makes you have this sense of hope that, you know, even 100 years from now, there might still be a, a Highland piper playing traditional Highland music in whatever form this culture still survives and there will still be someone who is that tether to the old world that we all came from. Yeah, for sure. I, I think um, like for a longest time because of uh, Highland or Scottish immigration to Ontario, we've always had a very thriving piping scene here. Um, not, it's not the same as it was uh, in the uh, late eighties and the nineties when I learned to play. Uh, a lot of that generation of Scottish immigrant that uh, came perhaps in, in the 60s or in the uh, early 70s, they passed away and um, immigration has been replaced. And so uh, the, the quality of piping in Southern Ontario has certainly taken a hit as a result of that. But for a long time, it was a real hotbed, as was uh, the province of Nova Scotia um, on the Atlantic coast, because a lot of Scots went there and also to Cape Breton. <clears throat> now changing gears a little bit there there is a, a historical figure that i've become somewhat fascinated with um my my wife is a big fan of liam neeson mm -hmm. and because of that i was able to convince her to watch the movie rob roy with me and this was kind of my first exposure to the uh folk hero outlaw historical figure of Rob Roy McGregor and digging into his background. I uncovered the, uh, the cattle watches, which was something that I didn't know that happened. It, and to explain this concept to people, um, the, the Highlanders would, basically form roving gangs in you know the the late 17th early 18th century and wander around the countryside and they would either steal cattle from the nobles or they would tell the nobles we're going to sit here and we're going to watch your cattle and make sure that no one steals them and you are going to pay us or we'll steal your cattle mm -hmm. and so the the idea of either being in one of these roving gangs and watching over someone's cattle, basically getting protection money to, to not steal their cattle or uh, encountering one of these gangs in the wild. 
immediately I started like putting pieces together in my head of, oh, you know, the, the adventure could go like this. You know, what if you're in one of these cattle watches and, you know, a, a cataplipus starts attacking a herd or something? There's all kinds of opportunity here. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about that. What, what are your thoughts on that particular uh, setup there? Well, I think uh, resources were limited. Yeah. Um, and in that context, um, you know, you you uh, take advantage of, of the opportunities that you have them. So if that meant, um, you know, a little bit of muscle or enforcement, then that's exactly what you did. And the Highland Scots were, you know, so Highland Scots were, um, uh, you know, Gaelic speaking. Mm -hmm. They were largely Catholic. Uh, so, you know, there's, um, they, and that would be distinguished from the Lowland Scots that were uh, colonized, primarily English um, speaking with a Scottish dialect that you're familiar with. Uh, primarily, Pro they were Protestantized. So, you know, there were distinct, the, um, the Lowland Scots looked down uh, on the Highland Scots and saw them as backward and descendant, not unlike uh, how uh, people in um, uh, the Anglo world or the Anglo American world looked at the North American Indian. They saw them as <clears throat> backwards, as descendant, uh, lack technology, that and and that literally inspired the uh, the tartan codification craze in uh, during the Romantic period in the, the early 1800s. So, for example, there there is a Gillespie tartan, but there's no precedent for the Gillespie tartan. It just sort of appears in books around 1815. Um, so. Uh, that sort of codification went on because the uh, landed English landed gentry that owned the land decided that, well, we can get rid of these uncouth Gaelic speaking Catholics off our land. We can make more money instead of having them crop as, as farmers on that land, we can make more money with sheep. So anytime that you go over to Scotland and you see sheep, um, it's kind of picturesque to see the white sheep dotting around the edges of a of a hill. You know that uh, that that's a historical thing. That that's a precedent that took place at a, in a particular period of time to evict these um, renters, these crofters, off the land to force them um, into uh, indentured servitude to Australia, to um, New Zealand, to the Americas, to Canada. And uh, so this is kind of like an interesting side note and some additional detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think uh, there potentially could have been some uh, some <clears throat> cattle herders or, or, you know, cattle thieves or sheep thieves in uh, in Scotland who were indentured sent to America and then eventually their uh, ancestors became cattle rustlers in the late 1800s in, in the United States. That's talk, talk about uh, generational employment there. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's a concept to think of, but th this idea of the uh, like the cattle rustler, it's a very, it's become a very American concept. It, it's very much couched in a lot of people's imagination in the old West. And so it's interesting to see this archetype brought forward in Scottish folklore and how it, it kind of has its origins there in, in the history that you just gave. Yeah. Well, if you look at it in a Canadian context, the two major um, motifs of Canadian history are the, the fur trade the westward expansion of the fur trade, and then the the railroad. Yep. So in the example of the fur trade, uh, most of the middlemen of the fur trade were uh, lowland Scots. And um, the if Highlanders were involved, they were sort of on the on the ground level um, with the, the voyagers, with French Canadians and with others, and uh, Aboriginal peoples, Portage, doing the portaging, uh, going out into the wilderness uh, and coming back. But the middlemen were really lowland Scots. And then um, it, it was primarily Scots of both uh, stripes that um, drove the Canadian Railroad, which are the, so the fur trade and the railroad are the two major discourses in, in Canadian history. 
And you can see that um, from start to finish. Even the very famous uh, photograph called the last spike, which is the final spike that went into the railroad connecting the Atlantic to the Pacific uh, was uh, hammered in by a Scotsman. Mm -hmm. And then of course our first prime minister, Sir Johnny MacDonald was also a Scotsman. Yep. Yep. There's, it, for as much Scottish influence as there is in in the United States, there there's a degree more in Canada, which it, it's well, interesting to see. And and you can still kind of see that, you know, even again in in the modern kind of deracinated Canadian, you can still see a little bit of that uh, Scottishness still at play in, in your, uh, your average Canadian. Yeah. You hear it in the language. So, uh, you know, oftentimes, so Canadians are known for saying a, at the end of their sentences, uh, mm -hmm. that definitely comes from the Scottish dialect where they'll say, instead of saying E H question mark, they'll say E M question mark M like that. You'll, you'll hear that a lot. Uh, of course we don't say the word a boot, but, um, <laughs> Americans think we do. And, uh, so that's kind of a fun, a fun thing, and that that's a legacy of the Scottish dialect in uh, in Canadian language. And you know, there was one time, uh, a time in which uh, Canada was called Scotland's Revenge on the English, <laughs> because there were so many Scots here, and they were so central to building our institutions, especially our institutions of higher learning. And one of the legacies that's been very sorely eroded from the Scots in Canada is the notion of merit in our institutions and particularly our institutions of higher learning because the Scots were effectively a colonized people. They were a stateless nation and there were limits on how far you could go if you were a Scot. Whereas in Canada, uh, left um, to their own industriousness and their own ingenuity, they could rise to whatever uh, field of endeavor they, they wanted. So there's um, that part of it is very important. And then, um, you know, uh, around the world, in, we're, you know, the Scots are known for their engineers. There's been very outstanding engineers, which is carried forward in the idea of Scotty from Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, uh, moving into a little bit of a, a different territory here, um, in dealing with a game like Dungeons and Dragons, we of course have to talk a little bit about the monsters. And th there are a number of monsters of, of Scottish origin. Um, a lot of people may not know this, but the Red Cap is, uh, it, it comes out of the folklore of Lowland Scotland or Northern England. So you, you find it a little bit there. Of course, uh, you know, everyone is familiar with the Loch Ness Monster, which has become a little bit of a, a joke. But, you know, the, there is something to be said about uh, a giant creature living in a lake that could either be friend or foe and, and a party having to figure out, uh, you know, w what exactly the intentions of this monster are and, you know, how, how do we appease it? How do we keep it from destroying the nearby town? That's definitely a, a classic adventure setup. But uh, one that I wanted to talk about a little bit here is the Bodak, um, because there's a lot of different ways you can you can take the, the Bodak and there's a lot of different uh, iterations of this legend, whether it's uh, a, a ethereal old man that's a uh, an omen of death or uh, someone who is literally breaking into houses and kidnapping children. Uh, there's there's a lot of different ways you can you can play around with this this kind of shadowy old man figure that is the Bodak. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And you know another really great example of Scottish folklore as it. Uh, takes place in popular culture and is really fruitful for something like Dungeons and Dragons uh, is the idea of the uh, um, the the movie. It's been iterated a couple times. The Hills Have Eyes. Are you familiar with yeah with that series of movies? The yeah. one in the late sixties, and then of course there were a couple of remakes. Mm -hmm. So the Hills Have Eyes. So that comes from a Scottish um, folk tale 
of the, what are called the, what's called the Sawney Bean clan. So Sawney Bean was a was a cannibal, a Scottish cannibal, and his uh, little band of inbred, um, <laughs> uncouth uh, cannibals. They would waylay um, people on on the highway, uh, meaning roadway, and then they would eat them. And uh, so that inspired that notion of of cannibals inspired the movies the hills have eyes so you know that's the kind of thing where you know if you go reading deep enough there there are kind of like some general legends but then when you get into local folklore that's really where the where the meat and potatoes uh, can be had and something like that and i was just in ireland last summer there was another uh, great example of a, a dolmen so this would have been a tomb so it's just stones propped up. It's got a top stone and, and walls. And it was called the Giant's Griddle. Um, and I, I had to, as soon as I, I didn't know about it prior to going, it wasn't on my list of locations to see, but I'm like, the Giant's Griddle? Okay, so I have to go see that. And uh, it was totally inspiring because, um, so I read the, like the local uh, folklore for it. And, uh, but the name really inspired me. I could see, you know, hill giants or... Uh, some other type of giants um, frying up some uh, human that they've uh, clobbered uh, on top of the giants, um, giants uh, uh, griddle stone, so to speak. So, and that was out in the in the middle of a peat of a peat farm. So I just uh, parked my car a fair distance away on, on the road, and I walked through somebody's peat farm. Um, to get to it. And then I uh, had lunch there and took a whole bunch of pictures. But that's the kind of thing you can find over there because the history is so, uh, it's going back thousands of years. It's not just going back a couple hundred years like you have in the new world relative to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that description of the, the, the cannibals that um, the Hills Have Eyes is based on uh, you can you can draw a straight line from that to something like the uh, the caves of chaos in uh, Keep on the Borderlands. That's very very reminiscent of uh, goblins and orcs living in these uh, this network of caves that you have to explore. That's that's definitely uh, something interesting to to think about. There is the the influence that might have had. Yeah, and you know we we hear a lot of um, uh, you know noise, uh, I'll call it, um, people talking about marginalizing discourses in gaming and in other forms. And, uh, you know, when you're talking Scottish folklore and Scottish history, you have to remember, you have to see the obvious, that Scotland was in a, a colonized relationship with England for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So when you see, or you, you see depictions of Scottishness as backwards, as descendant, as uh, uncouth, as incomprehensible because of their language, um, as uh, ugly. When you see these kinds of things, uh, you have to understand that there was a, there is a marginalizing discourse that's framed these kinds of things. And uh, and I know a lot of people just want to wave their flag when it deals with some with a person of color. But that's just not true. I mean, it's just not not true. And it doesn't the historical record doesn't show that either from the standpoint of either, say, for example, the Irish in America or the Scots in their relationship with England. Mm -hmm. And and when you deal with, uh, you know, people who try to draw a straight line from, uh, you know, quote unquote, marginalized communities that that exist now to these fantasy concepts of. Uh, others that we deal with, I, like to be brutally honest with these people, there's more uh, the orcs and goblins have more in common with the Picts than they do uh, any kind of uh, you know African or or Asian influence. Like you 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 see the the way that these uh, creatures are described and pretty much what. What comes to mind in you know the the historians and and writers who were uh, creating these concepts, especially you know someone like Tolkien or someone like Robert E. Howard, uh, who mm -hmm. wrote extensively about fictionalized Picts in his uh, in his Hyborian Age stories, mm -hmm. the orc is more similar to to something like the the Pict than you know it, 
whatever modern day activists want to parallels they want to draw to you know what whatever's uh kind of in the zeitgeist now yeah that's true and people uh i mean that that view um like the, that the view forwarded by some is quite myopic if you go back and you look i just rewatched, for example the uh, rank and bass uh return of the king mm -hmm. and uh, the orcs in there are white uh, so the this nonsense, um, I think, is just it's on un, it's unbalanced uh, discourse. Uh, it's myopic, and yeah. you know when you when you craft an argument on any subject at all, and you have outliers that don't fit your argument, you're faced with a choice. You can either attempt to incorporate the outliers into your argument, or you can put the blinders on and you can just not include them at all. And most of what I read about stuff like that tends to come from the myopic view. Oh, well, we just can forget that stuff because it's not not relevant to our argument, even though it undercuts the argument if uh, if used against it. So you know these things are out there. If you uh, you read widely and you are um, you know familiar with popular culture on the subject, so uh, that's all available if people want to read it and, and, and look at the historical precedents in gaming, in popular culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It Honestly, like there is, there's so much about kind of the, the ancient peoples of, uh, you know, the, the British Isles and uh, Ireland and Scotland that, that many like modern people don't even it's it's an aspect of history that's rarely ever touched on even when you are dealing with you know the the roman period um typically your only explanation or your only exploration of these people groups kind of stops at hadrian's wall and no one kind of looks beyond uh you know what was going on north of there and uh you know northeast of there um and and so I, I think a lot of people should, you know, take another look at some of these legends because uh, they are they are and were very influential on the uh, the people who we uh, consider to be luminaries of fantasy. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Like the original uh, peoples that that populated Britain um, when there was a land bridge to to Europe uh, genetically were more dark haired and blue eyed. Um, then when Britain gets isolated by the channel and then we get the migration of peoples, the Anglo-Saxon migration towards Britain, uh, that's when you get a change in the demographic uh, of Great Britain. So, you know, these, um, there's really interesting um, archaeology and genetic history being done right now on remains to the point where um, there's some fascinating information available both by um, on on YouTube and also in published material. Mm -hmm. And those first contact experiences must have been fascinating. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And all that's right. All that's right for uh, inspiring gaming or inspiring um, interesting fictional narratives mm -hmm. based in history. Yeah. Yeah. I I, again, th there's a lot of talk, and and there's been talk uh, recently today about you know Appendix N and, and you know inspirations like that. W one of the most interesting conversations I had um, on this subject was actually over a year ago, probably more like a year and a half ago, uh, when I had Crossface on the show, my my good friend Crossface. And we talked a lot about just reading history in general and how influential that can be on on gaming, because you don't, you know, for, for people who have trouble reading fantasy fiction, you don't actually have to read fantasy fiction. In fact, I'd say that you can learn a great deal more about what makes for good fantasy by understanding some of the real things that that did happen in history and uh, kind of making fantastical versions of those uh, for your players to explore. That's right. Um, 
So what I do, anytime I do a project, I um, create a preliminary bibliography. And, and there's two of those. There's one just for the history, the archeology, span the anthropology. Then there's another one for the gaming side of it. Mm -hmm. And just because something's happened in history or you have a situation maybe that's partly known, say Go Gobekli Tepe, for example. Yep. So there's amazingly cool archeology span that's resetting our understanding of when farming communities developed. Do we have all the detail? No. Are we going to have all the detail in our lifetime? No, we're probably not. But you can take uh, that kind of material and then you can start extrapolating from it in a gaming context and, and be inspired by it. And it doesn't, you can, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, there's nothing written anywhere that says it has to be true to the, to the past, but it can be inspired by the past. And if it makes for a great game, and it makes for evocative visuals and things like that, then now you're way to the races. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you find when you look at the, uh, you know, when you look at those historical narratives that have a lot of holes in them, when, when you read some of the narratives, uh, people of the time will have already filled those holes in with supernatural creatures and monsters. And so it's just a matter of kind of bringing that forward and fleshing it out a little bit. I mean, that's you look at something like uh, the the Grimalkin or or Cat Sith and understand that you know in the Scottish Highlands there uh, are wild cats that you know attack people and and would attack people out of nowhere. And you can see where the mythology of of Cat Sith comes into play. Uh, people trying to explain these, uh, you know, killer wildcats that attack, uh, you know, helpless people when, when they get the opportunity. And so just, you know, understanding your, your gaming region and the kinds of things that would thrive there and the kinds of things that those things would prey on, mm -hmm. you create an ecosystem for your, your game and, and using real world ecosystems to fuel that is, I, I to me, that's gaming at another level is, you know, having an understanding of the real world that you can then transpose onto a fantasy world. Sure. And being aware of, so if you're reading a folk tale or a children's tale or something like that, being aware of the use of metaphor uh, and being uh, aware of the allegories and things like that. These are the, that's the, um, you, you can, so there's, there's one meaning one surface level meaning if you read the story, but then if you're reading it for these other things, now you're deepening your engagement the way the, the author intended or the way the story was told over time. So like that, that's um, terrific and wonderful detail that you can bring to your game and you don't have, you can have that sort of coming out in your descriptions as a DM. You don't have to beat players over the head with it. Now it may go over their head, but the, the ones that are paying attention will will pick up on it. Um, for example, I'm a big, uh, you know, I read, um, I can read Robert Burns in the old Scottish dialect. And so uh, there's some terrific stuff in um, in uh, Tam O'Shanter, his opus poem, uh, just a, like it's a ghost story, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and it's, you know, he wrote down a lot of these things that were told and retold or that, that provided inspiration for his poetry. And, uh, and, and there's wonderful material you can take from stuff like that too. Yep. Now on kind of a different track, but you know, related to what we've been talking about here, there's this concept that I've been wrestling with and, and this goes beyond even, you know, the specifics of the region that, that we've been talking about this evening. Throughout human history, we've kept this tradition of oral storytelling alive. And it's taken various different forms, whether it's, uh, you know, the, the epics of Homer or, you know, telling fish stories with your friends at the bar. But now we have these things... Uh, called role-playing games and without kind of reopening the game versus narrative uh, debate here, because I, I 
actually fall more on the game side these days. There is some element of an oral tradition, an oral storytelling tradition that comes about when we play these role playing games. Even though the history itself is fake, there is a history that's being created and passed from game master to player and then from all the players who were present to their friends of this history of a world that never was. What are your thoughts on this? Do you, do you see role playing as kind of an evolution of of the oral tradition of storytelling and and history? Uh, I think um, if we're talking like storytelling as it would take place in families around the fireplace or, or and preceding the fireplace around the fire mm -hmm. um, that we've done for thousands and thousands of years. So that kind of storytelling doesn't really exist anymore. Um, we're not really storytellers, we're, we're story consumers. Um, and so that's really punched a hole in our ability to tell new narratives, to uh, our ability to, um, to spin uh, a narrative that encapsulates everybody around us. So, yeah, and, and, you know, that's what people would do, right? Before, before we had language, we, or, or barely language, we'd stare up at the stars um, in the evening. Uh, and we'd, we'd huddle around the fire for fear of predators and, and whatnot. And we, you know, keep each other um, warm and safe and, and tell stories. And then again, around, around the hearth, the, the, the center of the house at the, at, at the, uh, the fireplace. And um, slowly but surely with the advent of, you know, um, film and television and radio and all these other uh, media forms, we've, we've become uh, pretty terrible storytellers. And that influences, that influences role-playing games to bring it back to your mm -hmm. um, original point. Yeah, I, I, I would definitely agree with that, that there's, there's this consumption nature to the way that we now kind of interact with stories. It, uh, stories have become commodified in a way and things that would have been, uh, you know, epic poems are now sold for, you know, $6 a piece as paperbacks or uh, I don't know. There's lots of, there's lots of weird implications to uh, the story being commodified. And, you know, the, these, the, the commodification of story now kind of taking away from even the, the quality of the story itself, as you're seeing with these big budget blockbuster movies that are just kind of determined to check boxes, whether that that's, you know, the ethnicity and orientation of their characters and actors or even just the events in the movie checking boxes. Uh, you know, every big movie now has a giant sky beam during the climax, so we have to make sure that's in our movie, otherwise it's not a real blockbuster. It, there's there's lots of, uh, frankly, disturbing implications uh, that, that come out of taking that to its logical conclusion. Uh, yeah, that's... Of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to jump in there. One of the things that just struck me when you're talking that really bugged me was, um, so if we take, for example, the Rings of Power uh, TV show. So when when they show people standing in the background, right, when mm -hmm. they have the extras in the background, right, so they're definitely doing what you were saying. It's a it's sort of like a, a an ethnic checklist. And but if you put that in in a and it's like supposed to be a quasi medieval context. But if you did that, right, so if you had some remote village somewhere uh, and everybody is basically, there's very little mobility uh, and people are just intermarrying over a period of time, there's going to be a homogeneity to uh, eye color, to skin color, to hair color. Yeah. And, um, and that just stands to reason. So even if you took, for example, if you did take the rings of power example and you had sort of two people, say, of Asian descent and two people of white descent and two people of African-American descent and so on and so forth, and you put them in a village, a couple generations later, you're going to have a fairly homogenous looking group of people. Uh, so it, there's what I call plausible diversity. And that's not it. 
Right. It's it's not realistic because if humans lived in a remote village, they would be intermarrying and doing their thing, and they'd all uh, homogeneity would be the result of that uh, mm -hmm. on a long enough timeline. So when I see that kind of thing, it breaks the frame of of what would actually happen in a in a real life medieval kind of context and and uh so then to me it when if i'm watching something like that it does kind of feel like a checklist and i don't think it shows a lot of forethought in the uh in the writing either right yeah for it to be kind of the the natural diversity as we saw in uh actual history you would have pockets of homogenous uh cultures and and racial groups that are separate from each other but still uh you know exist as separate entities and have you know separate features but in these groups themselves there is like you said uh homogeneity because you know these groups were insular and didn't have much interaction with each other i think that's in a fantasy context that's something that game of thrones did really well so if you had the people north of the wall, there's uh, then the people just south of the wall, then the people in the Midlands and the, the people in King's Landing would be more cosmopolitan. The people in the south would have a different look entirely, all based on relatively uh, um, the, uh, excuse me, the um, uh, relative to where the equator would be, right? Yeah. That's really what race is. How close did your ancestors live or how far away did they live relative to the equator? And, and what characteristics did they have to uh, adapt to in dealing with the environments that they found themselves in, which is exactly. why the closer you get to the equator, the darker people's skin is, and the further away you get, the lighter their skin is. Right, and which is why like Neanderthals were shorter than Homo sapien. They were much stronger. Uh, they were designed to live in, in the woodlands of, of, of Europe. Um, mm -hmm. The Homo sapien was designed for the, the plains and the um, savannas of Africa, and we developed in relation to to that. So um, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, people, all this stuff is available to people. You know, it's it's part of the historical record. It's part of the genetic record. You don't have to go very far to find it either. But when you start um, noting stuff like this, it makes gets people bent out of shape. But I don't see why. It it's inconvenient to the narrative they're trying to push. Unfortunately, you know it's, and and that's again kind of the the sad part, or the the you know the sorry state of modern academia, modern storytelling is this denial of fundamental human truths. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I d I don't want to end this on the the downer note of people denying the reality on their in in front of their face so to to kind of close this out here are there any concepts that we didn't discuss tonight that you feel are important or that you want to highlight uh as we're kind of uh you know closing the loop on on tonight's episode yeah i think that um so let's say you have an interest in um uh folklore to inspire uh a game or a game setting or um, a region, or whatever it may be, um, read widely. Like so, whatever um, background uh, your your culture may be, or one that you're interested in, uh, read read as widely as you can, and read the stuff intended for five year olds all the way up, including you know if it, if it goes from uh, a children's bedtime story all the way up to say something. Uh, like uh, a poet like Robert Burns uh, and everything in between. And the more widely you read, the more you can um, extract and pull and you can see how some of these things are conveyed uh, over time. Like, for example, you know, I'm sure a lot of people have read uh, Grimm's uh, fairy tales. I much, much prefer uh, the originals than I do the um, the revised. Uh, like, so, mm -hmm. you know, RPGs are, have gone through this, well, we're surviving this kind of forced revision uh, of our games and our um, sort of heroes and the hobby that, that created it. Uh, but this went through, people will remember, this went through children's narratives 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah. So uh, it's just RPGs are so niche. It's, it's just been, and the, the climate has been such that we're 
kind of uh, addressing it and, and fending it off right now that this has happened in other areas and and I think people are aware. So my my best suggestion would be uh, read widely, um, poach from from everything, especially you know these a lot of these narratives, stories, poems they were told in an oral tradition for a long time before they became um, codified in a book. Uh, yeah. You can use use the example of singing "Old Lang Syne" on New Year's Eve, uh, it, which Robert Burns is the one who is credited with with putting it on paper. But people were singing that tune for um, goodness knows hundreds of years prior to that time. So you know, there's a fascinating material, um, and and the etymology. Um, what's something I'm a a uh, minor student of being an academic. I'd like to know where words came from, uh, how they developed, uh, what their original language, what their original use was, because Tolkien did a lot of that in trying to pull together names that he used to uh, for elves or he used for dwarves and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people have modeled this kind of thing that we're talking about tonight, and they've done so in very clear terms, Tolkien being, I think, the greatest example. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And and this is also why you can get some variance in versions of stories and versions of poems, depending on how widely you read and what sources you look for, is because of how uh, ubiquitous some of this stuff was before it was actually uh, written down and codified in, in particular manners. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, obviously you are, uh, you know, you now have a uh, dragon slayer role-playing game available for uh, the public to buy. It is over on drive through RPG. I will drop the link here in chat. Uh, is there anything else you want to plug while you are here? No, not at all. Um, you know, I just, this is the 50th uh, anniversary year of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, and, you know, we should be acknowledging Gary Gygax in all of that to, to have um, brought this game forward that, you know, so many people have enjoyed. So, you know, if you have an opportunity to play a whole bunch with uh, people that your regular gaming group or perhaps to connect with um, friends that you gamed with in the past, either online or face to face. I mean, do it like this is the year to do it. This is the 50th anniversary. So uh, mm -hmm. everyone go out and enjoy your gaming this year for sure. Definitely. Definitely. All right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for Roland Bones this week. Uh, as I said at the top of the show, uh, myself and the wonky will be on Black Lodge Games this Thursday at 8.30 p.m. Central. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know Black Lodge Games has been here in chat. Uh, you know, they, they are great dudes over there. Uh, I'm looking forward to that conversation. And then next week uh, here on Rolling Bones, Victor Gorchev will be returning and we will be talking about more uh, modern fantasy and uh, you know the the Kickstarter that he is doing for uh, modern necessities for old school essentials, all the different stretch goals and and variations that he has on that uh, that you guys will be able to see. I'm looking forward to that conversation. You guys know how much I love Vic and how much I love talking to him on the show. Uh, so until then, whether you rolled a one or a twenty, I'm so glad that you rolled your bones with me, Ryan Howard, and I will see you guys next time. <laughs>